I'm excited about this message this morning. It's been on my heart for a little while. In fact, it's one of the reasons we're doing Friend Day today. As you, uh, if you've been around the last few years, this isn't our usual time that we do Friend Day. But there's a message that's that the Lord has has been giving me for a little while now, and I, I want to give it to you. And I believe this is the right time. I'm in the book of Esther, chapter 14. The book of Esther, chapter 14. Have y'all noticed there's not a 14? (laughs) It's chapter 4. I like to keep you on your toes. Chapter 4. Give you a few verses of scripture there. If you're there, say amen. Amen. If you're not, say, oh, me. All right. A little bit. Esther chapter 4. Look with me at verses 12 through 14. This is what God's word says. It says, when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to a royal position for such a time as this. Let's pray. Lord, we love you so much. And we thank you. For your word, Lord, I'm grateful that it has the power to transform lives. Lord, they're sitting in many who can testify to that, that you've changed and transformed their lives to the better. But Lord, I believe that there are many that need that transformation this morning. I believe that there are many sitting here, Lord, that needs a change. It is those that I speak to, Lord, and I pray that you soften their hearts and open their minds. I pray that you give them the ears to be attentive and receptive to what you have to say this morning. Lord, perhaps there are those that are sitting here, Lord, and all all that's going through their mind is what they're going to eat after the service. Or how much longer are we going to be sitting here? Lord, I pray that you remove those distractions so that we can focus upon you. Lord, you know that I can't preach. You know that I can't say one word of significance without you backing it. And I pray that you empower every word that comes out of my mouth for the next few moments. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you remember as a kid when the teacher asked a question and you knew the answer and you just couldn't wait to give the answer? You just couldn't wait for her to call on you so you could tell her what you knew? That, that's kind of how I feel this morning. I, I, I just can't wait to let loose what God has been revealing to me. I remember one time when I did that and uh, the teacher did call up on me and, and I gave her the answer and, and, and uh, one of my friends started crying beside me and, and I said, man, why are you crying? Because I didn't get to give the answer. And I said, well, I gave the right answer. Were you going to say the right answer? And he said, yes, but I was going to say it a different way. (laughs) Surely you've heard the story of Esther, but perhaps it's going to be a little different than what you're used to. One of my heroes in the faith was Winston Churchill. and He was a no-nonsense kind of guy. and He was known to be quick on his responses, uh, especially those that criticized him and there was a, uh, a known woman within the cabinet there, a lady by the name of Aster, and it was well known that they were always at each other. And one time Aster told Sir Winston Churchill, if I was married to you, I would, I would put rat poison in your coffee. 
And without even hesitating, uh, Sir Winston Churchill responded. She, he said, Aster, if I was married to you, I would drink it. <laughs> <laughs> Sir Winston Churchill, he said these words, and I think it's something that we all need to take note of. This is what he said. There comes a special moment in everyone's life, a moment for which that person was born. That special opportunity, when he seizes it, will fulfill his mission, a mission for which he is uniquely qualified. In that moment, he or she finds greatness. It is their finest hour. Robert Moffat, he said these words, we'll have all eternity to celebrate our victories, but only one short hour before sunset to win them. Just this past week, Benjamin Netanyahu won another election to remain the Prime Minister of Israel. In leading up to this election, he spoke to the United States Senate and Congress. And during his speech, he talked about Esther, and, and how the Bible says that she was put in a position for such a time as this. And, and he related that to our present time. He talked about the opportunities that uh, are at hand and the urgency to do some things right now. I truly believe that many are sitting here today that have been given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity and you've squandered them. For some reason or another... The blessings of God has been on your life in times. There, there's been do- windows of opportunity that's been opened. There's been doors that you should have walked through, but for some reason or another, you've allowed them to pass you by. And I'm convinced that God is not through with you yet. He's putting before you an opportunity of a lifetime, but along with that opportunity, church, comes the urgency to do some things right now. I believe with all my heart uh, what, what the Lord has been telling me. There's some people here that need to hear this. If some things are going to change in your life, if you're going to get better, you need to do it now. You need to stop playing around. You need to stop putting it off and get to working on what God wants you to do with your life. Let me give you a little background to the story there. The great Persian Empire had been taken over by Babylon or, or, or had overtaken Babylon. And at this time, they ruled the entire world. And the king of Persia, a guy by the name of Xerxes, wanted to have a great feast. He was going to host a banquet. And he invited uh, 127 of the provinces to attend this banquet. His empire and prestige would be on full display. And so he goes and tells his wife to get ready. To come to the banquet. Uh, It's going to be a big showdown. And she flat out tells him no. She says, I'm not going. And so word gets around and the king's teachers and leaders, they come to him and say, "Uh, King, we can't have this. If you allow this to go unpunished, all the women throughout the kingdom are going to want to rebel and think it's okay to rebel against their husbands. So you got to do something. And so they came up with a plan. They said, here's what we'll do, king. We'll take the finest women in the empire and we'll, we'll bring them all together and we'll, uh, we'll bathe them and we'll, we'll give them manicures and we'll, we'll doll them up real good for you and you can spend some time one-on-one with each of them and you can decide who you want. See, most of you thought the Bachelor show was something new, didn't you? <laughs> and so they go, they, they, they do this, and, and, and he picks a lady by the name of Esther. Long story short, she becomes a king. Then short, or she becomes a queen, and shortly after that, one man in the king's cabinet by the name Haman comes up with this idea that all the Jews should bow to the king. So there's this man, which happens to be a cousin of the new queen. He makes it known that he's not going to bow to a man and he only bows to the one and only true God. Well, Haman gets hacked off and he comes up with another plan and and he he puts everybody together and, and he gets it passed that all the Jews 
should be destroyed. All the Jews should be killed. Mordecai realizes how serious this is, and so he goes and he tells his cousin Esther, listen, you're a Jew. The king doesn't know that you're a Jew, but God knows that you're a Jew. And Esther, perhaps God has placed you in this situation for such a time as this. Now, initially, Esther had some excuses. She had some reasons why she couldn't fulfill what was at hand in front of her. And Mordecai responds to her. And, and, and his response is, is the, the, the few verses that we have read. And I believe they're very, very important. And what he says in that response, I think, are very important for us and, and a few things that we need to note. And I want to give those things to you. Number one is this. Position doesn't discharge the man's duty. Position doesn't discharge the man's duty. Verse 13, it says, Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. You see, many people don't ever accomplish what God wants them to accomplish because of their position. What I mean by that is this. You enjoy who you are. There's many of you that are very satisfied with what's going on in your life. There are many of you that have everything that you need and there's no fear or there's no um, disruption in what's going on and you have no plan to change it. And it's keeping you from being who God wants you to be. You continue to avoid God's plan because that plan may interfere with your plan. To be who God wants you to be may mean for you to do some things and give up some things and you don't want to, you don't want to be a part of it. Church, God's got a plan for each and every one of us. And don't ever think that you will escape punishment or consequences by deciding to do your own thing. A young man told me a long time ago, Pastor, I don't want to lose what I've got. I don't want to lose what I got. I began to tell him what, what, what following God was and, and what that would mean for his life. And he simply said, Pastor, I don't want to lose what I've got. And I couldn't help to think, what are you going to lose? There are a lot of people that, that will never receive what God wants them to have because they're worried about losing what Satan and the world has given to them. Church, in my book, God's ways are higher than our ways. God knows everything. What he has in store for us is a lot better than what the world has in store for us. When the Israelites were complaining, I love what Moses told them in Deuteronomy 6, 23. He says, but he brought us out from there. He was speaking of the bondage of Egypt. He said, he brought us out of there to bring us in and give us the land that he promised an oath to our ancestors. You see, church, never forget this. When God brings you out of something, he brings you in to something else. You see, God will bring you out of gloom to bring you into gladness. God will bring you out of misery to bring you into mercy. He'll bring you out of guilt to bring you into grace. He'll bring you out of loneliness to bring you into the presence of the Lord. He'll bring you out of sin, church, to bring you into salvation. He'll bring you out of crying to bring you into contentment. He'll bring you out of hurt to bring you into hope. He'll bring you out of a life of hangovers and give you one of hallelujahs, amen? He'll bring you out of fears and bring you into fun. He'll bring you out of lying. Hold on, I'm not done. And he'll bring you into laughing. He'll bring you out of the clubs, church, to bring you into the church. I can testify this morning that God brought me out of the pool hall to bring me into the pulpit. Church, he'll bring you out of hell so that he can bring you into heaven. Aren't you glad whatever he takes you out of, he'll bring you into something else. Never, ever forget it. I hear people all the time, Pastor, you don't know. I'm going through hell. Well, keep going because you're not meant through to be in hell. You're meant to be in heaven. Whatever you're going through, 
whatever you're fighting through, keep going. God will bring you out of that to bring you into something else. One of my favorite phase, phrases in all the scripture. And it's throughout the Bible. It's a simple phrase. It simply says, it came to pass. Things don't come to stay, church. They come to pass. Eventually, this will pass in your life. Eventually, it'll pass. Number two is this. Peace doesn't destroy the master's design. Peace doesn't destroy the master's design. Now when I say peace, I'm saying by keeping your peace. By keeping quiet. See, many times we, 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 we develop this negative thing, but we've turned it into a positive. Oh, we just need to keep the peace. Oh, we just need to keep the peace. Church, if you need to do something right, I don't care who it bugs. I don't care who it upsets. You need to do it. Amen? Look at, verse, look at the first part of verse 14. It says, for if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. You see, God's got a grand plan for his place, for his people, and for this planet. And he wants you to be involved in that plan. And he wants to use you to accomplish his purposes. But never ever forget this. God's plan will be carried out whether we choose to be involved in it or not. God's plan will be carried out whether you want to be a part of it or not. Church, nobody's irreplaceable. God wants to use you. He wants to do great things through you. But if you don't want to be a part of that, he'll find somebody else. He'll find somebody else. Don't, don't, don't ever, don't ever tell, let the devil keep telling yourself, well, I'll just wait. I, I, I can be used whenever I want to, whenever I want to. And all the while, God's having to put somebody in your place over and over and over and over to achieve his purposes. And his plan. I want to give you a thought in, in four words, four simple words that if you truly believe it, if you truly accept it, it'll change your life. And it's this God is in control. God is in control. We find it stated over and over in the Bible. Psalm 103 19, it says, The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his sovereignty rules over all. Psalm 115.3, it says, But our God is in the heavens, but He, and He does whatever He pleases. Psalm 135, 5-6, it says, I too give witness to the greatness of God, our Lord, high above all other gods. He does just as He pleases. However, wherever, and whenever. There are many Christians today choosing to stand on the sidelines and not do anything to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. God wants to tell you this morning, stop being quiet when you need to be speaking. Stop sitting down when you need to be standing. Stop doing nothing when you need to be in the game and being active. Position doesn't discharge the man's duty. Peace doesn't destroy the master's design. And the third thing is this. Procrastination doesn't defend the man's destiny. Procrastination, church, doesn't defend the man's destiny. Look at the latter part of verse 14. It simply says this, And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. The Bible is full of words of urgency for his people. Matthew 3, 2, it says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Romans 13, 11, it says, Do this knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now, salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. 2 Corinthians 6, 2, it says, For he says, In the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor Today is the day of salvation. 
The words of Jesus are filled with urgency. The Bible says that we're not promised tomorrow. The news of history is filled with sad stories of people who had an opportunity to do something and let it slip through their fingers. They waited too long to do something and they missed out on something that they were meant for. I believe with all my heart that God wants me to tell you this. Listen to me. For for many of you, right now is the time. Right now is your time time. Church, I see it all the time. I see people that, 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 that come to me and, and they want to be changed. They want to be helped. And, and we talk about some things and, and they put it off. And they put it off. And they put it off. And years go by and years go by and I'm like, my goodness, what happened? What happened? It's a sad reality to see people in their, in their latter 40s and, and 50s that are still acting like teenagers. Isn't it? Isn't it sad? That, that, whether they're hooked on something or still partying like a little child and they've missed out on what God wants for their life. For many of you, I, I, I believe this with all my heart. God wants me to tell you, if, if you really want to get your life right, you need to do it today. If you really want to get things right, today is your time. If God's going to use you, now is your time. If you really want to get off the roller coaster of ups and downs, now is your time. I had a friend tell me a while back, He said, Jamie, man, Jesus is coming soon. I mean, just look around. He he, he could be here any day. I said, yeah, I I know that. He said, no, no, I'm serious, man. Listen to me. Jesus could come back right now. I said, man, I've read the Bible. I've preached on the end times. I know he could. No, 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 Jamie, you're, you're not getting it. He could come this second. I said, man, if you say that to me again, I'm gonna punch you. I know he's coming. I know he can come any time. I said, what's your point? He said, my point is this, Jamie. Whatever you want to do for the Lord, you better do it now. Whatever you want to, to be said and done after your life is over, you better get to doing it. You better get on the ball and start doing it because our time is coming to an end. Here... I'm closing with this. Rocky, the uh, team can come up. The, The Bible says in John 6, it says this. Nobody comes to the Father unless the Lord draws him. Or nobody comes to Jesus unless the Father draws him. See, what that means, church, is that God's grace is made available to us even before we come to salvation. Because of sin, because of the wickedness, because of the roaming of the devil, we can't come to him unless he provides grace for us. Aren't you glad? We don't have to wonder that that somebody's pulling us to him. But but listen to me. We can't come to him unless he opens that door. So so, so listen to me. Many times we make the mistake of when we feel, "I, I need to be saved today. Or when we feel, man, I need to make some dedications today. Many times what we tell ourselves is, well, those desires are coming from me. I can put them off whenever. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't give yourself that much credit. Those thoughts come from God. That pulling and drawing comes from Him. And church, it's very important that we take advantage of that. The saddest thing that I witness as a pastor is that when we begin to pray. And I begin to ask, who's dealing with things? Who wants to be saved? Who who, who wants to, uh, uh, just wants me to lift them up in prayer? Many times, I see men and women, they'll hold on to that pew. And boy, sometimes I can even see them shaking. You can tell the Lord is dealing with them. 
You can tell the Lord is, is, is trying to speak to them and get them to move. And they won't let it go. But I always keep my eyes on those people because you know what I notice happens? Next time, they're still holding on to that pew, but their knuckles aren't as red. The grip isn't as tight. And then the next time I see them and it's time to pray, they're still holding on to that pew. But they're just resting their hands there now. And then eventually I know that they're not even holding on to the pew anymore. And then before you know it, I notice that when I'm praying, that same person that was shaking, I knew the Lord was dealing with them at one time. Now when I begin to pray, they're looking up at the ceiling. They're not in tune at all with what God's trying to tell them and what God is trying to do. Listen to me. I, 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 I really believe this. For some of you, if, if, for, for some things to happen in your life, you've been putting decisions off. You've been putting commitments off. Now is your time. Now is your time. Don't think that you're the only one God can use. Don't think that you're the only one that he's waiting for. He wants to do something. But church, perhaps such a time as this. Perhaps there's some reason that that person has begged you for weeks to come to friend day. And really the only reason you're here is because they wouldn't shut up. You had no intention on being involved or even accepting what the Lord has to say. You just hear, perhaps this is your time. Perhaps now is the time to pray. Lord, we love you.